She is a fellow SUNY Geneseo student, and yeah, I'm going to play a video quickly. I 
surrounding it. And from the outside, it appeared to be every appeared to be someone with everything to hope for and aspire to. And that's how I entered school. Acting confident and sure of myself, when underneath I was terrified of being away from everything that I knew, not sure whether I chose the right school, the right major, basically anything there was to worry about. Call me that girl. Able to jump to the worst conclusion in the thing But there was no way I could have predicted anything that happened next. Because six months later, I was sitting on a step outside my therapist's office, 50 pounds thinner. I need this. And it was the hardest thing I had ever done in my life. It felt like you're about to jump off the edge of the cliff, like bungee jumping. Like you're standing right on the edge and you're looking down and every bone and muscle in your body's like, this is not a good idea. And it felt like I was risking my life. And at that point I was terrified of food. Any food, of apples and carrots and oatmeal, not even thinking about cake or beer or chicken wings. Food was the scariest thing in the world to me. It was almost scarier to imagine eating than it was dying. So I had turned. Okay, we're gonna come back to that. I had turned from this <coughs> to this. And then I knew way more about eating disorders than I had ever wanted to. And then here I go back. Um, before I really get into more of my story, I just want to take a step back and describe briefly as best I can what it's like to live with an eating disorder. If I were to walk out on Court Street and just grab a random kid and drive him in here and ask them what they thought anorexia was, their answer would probably be something like not wanting to eat, lack of appetite, no food really sounds good to you, and that's what most people <coughs> think. And if you look at Google, the first one is the Google definition, that's what the I, I call Google like the popular definition. It's lack of loss of appetite for food and also a desire to lose weight by refusing to eat. And that word refusing is key. And I'm going to come back to that. First, if you look at the DSM, the, it's the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. So basically what psychologists or psychiatrists use to diagnose mental illness problems. You know, it says, you know, low body weight restricting of food. But then it says an intense fear of being weight or becoming fat, and the disturbance in the way one's body weight or shape is experienced. And then the last part, an undue influence of <coughs> body shape and weight on self-evaluation. So like Mary was saying, that last part means the way that you look on the outside plays a huge role in who you think you are as a person. Not your personality, not your characteristics, not that you're you know, a daughter or a mother or a sister, but the fact that you are fat or thin or have long hair or blue eyes. Now, for the first part of that definition, the intense fear of gaining weight, I was an English major for a little while, for a psychology major, so you get nerdy for just one second. But when professional writers write, they choose each word really carefully, especially if it's in like a, a professional work like this. So the fact that they chose to use the word intense instead of just saying, you know, a fear of gaining weight, it's really key, and I can't imagine enough how dead on they were. Now, if you have an intense fear of something, to so say you're afraid of heights or you're afraid of snakes, what do you do with that fear? Do you, you know, seek out those things that you love, or do you try to stay away from them at all possible costs? Probably the second one. So, the Google definition saying anorexia is a refusal of things, a refusal to maintain weight, a refusal to eat. Basically, that's like saying someone who has a fear of snakes refuses to play with snakes. It just doesn't make sense. But eating disorder, it's not just a lack of appetite. It's not just refusing to eat. It was the worst kind of torture I could ever imagine because it was 24-7. My tormentor never slept. He never left the room. As much as I worked, I begged, and I got help, he would not stop. He wouldn't stop telling me that I was ugly and unworthy and undeserving of anything. Restricting food and exercising was just the outside expression of what was actually happening inside, which was the worst part. Um, and when I did what he wanted, restricting food or exercising a lot, he stopped with the berating and the demeaning for a little while. And when I didn't, things got worse. 
And he played out everything I did. It wasn't just the food and exercise. I got a bad grade on the test. I was the worst student in the world. And I actually believed it. And when I didn't return a parent's, parent's phone call, I was a horrible daughter. When I didn't work out, I was weak and lazy and unmotivated. And that went on all day, every day. And when I would try to sleep, it got worse. Because then I would go over everything I had done during the day, everything I ate, everything I said. And I would criticize it and pick it apart. And mostly I would be afraid. I would be afraid of dying in my sleep. Because I knew that what I was doing was not healthy. I, I knew how bad it was. But I did not know how to stop. So how did I get from graduating to crying over an apple? started slowly at first, like most changes do, you know, you go to the gym more often, you start eating healthy, and I loved the way it made me feel. You know, going to the gym, working out, eating healthy, it makes you feel good, because it's good for you. But then my internal struggles and fears and anxieties, they didn't go away, so in order to cope with them and make myself feel better, I started doing the gym and the exercising and healthy eating more and more. I remember passing my roommate in the hall one day. And I was headed to the gym for the second time. And she noticed, and she said something to me. And I said, well, you know, I like to do three miles every day. And I've only done two. And she, at the time, said, oh, like, good job. Like, I wish I had that self-discipline. But in my head, a completely different story was going on. It wasn't just that I liked doing three miles a day. I needed to do three miles a day in order to feel even just okay about myself. And at first, I didn't really notice a problem with my habits or anything. Who put this apple? <laughs> um, but I can tell you the exact moment that that changed. I had gone out to dinner with friends. I had been with friendlies. And I still remember exactly what I ordered. And this was four <coughs> years ago. But I, I ordered a buffalo chicken wrap on wheat with a side of corn and a glass of water. And I was feeling great. You know, when you go out with your friends, people that you love, you, you come home, you're feeling energized and empowered. And then I looked up the caloric information for the food that I just eaten, which I would never advise you guys to do. It's the worst decision ever. <laughs> but my mood instantly changed. And I started crying, and I was so upset. And the only thing I could think about was getting that food that I just eaten out. So I went to the gym, and I exercised till I burned all the calories I just eaten. And I came home teary, sweaty. I didn't want to feel this way. No one wants to feel that way. The thing that had once given me power had turned into a demon in my head. And it literally and figuratively ate away at me every day. That was the night I said I need to get help. So I got help. I went to therapy. And things worsened despite all that. Um, and the eating disorder ruled my life. Like Mary was talking about, one of the first things that happens is you start to isolate. Because... The more people you hang out around, the more people who notice that what you're doing is unhealthy. And so I didn't go out because I might eat or drink something that I shouldn't. I didn't see my friends that often. And I thought about food all the time. Every waking second I was planning meals that I would never eat or making food for my roommates or asking them, <laughs> listen to my roommate during all this, Asking her what she ate, like, what did you have for breakfast? What did you have for lunch? What did you have for, oh, how did that taste? What, what? Because I was so obsessed with food, the thing that I could not have. And so part of that is emotional. You know, when you can't have something, you, you just want it, and you obsess over it. But part of it is biological, too. When a person is starving as a human being, your brain makes you think about food. Because the more you think about something, the more likely you are to do it. But I had to avoid food at all costs. So, um, and that's a lot harder than it sounds because food is everywhere. Food is here. You know, two years ago, I would have been terrified to come to this event. Not because, I mean, I would have been afraid to get up in front of you, but I would have been afraid of the food in the reception room. And what happens when your roommates go out to dinner? You know, do you go with them? Do you stay home? You do go out. What do you order? And how much of that do you eat? You have to plan with an eating disorder, you plan everything out ahead of time. So at times it was just annoying. And other times it was heartbreaking. How do you go to a family Easter or Thanksgiving with an eating disorder? How do you celebrate a birthday when you can hardly sit at a table, let alone have cake? And so instead of telling you guys about that, I'm going to show you a video.